Okay, button, 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 and I've got the buttons. How are you? Hello. Uh, good evening, and welcome to Shelf Analysis, episode 51. I think I should point out for the benefit uh, of those people who are not watching this live and who are watching it at some point in the future, that this episode is going out live on November 4th, 2020. This is the day after the US presidential election of 2020. And as we sit here, right here and right now, we still have no idea who the next president of the United States is going to be, although it's leaning in one direction, but none of us are allowing ourselves the ability to think about that right now which is why shelf analysis is such a fantastic diversion for the next 40 minutes uh, or so. Thank you so much um, for, for joining me. If it's your first time on, how are you? There are 50 other episodes prior to this. We've been doing this, this since the very beginning of uh, lockdown 2020. Uh, I talked to an author in their home from my spare bedroom uh, in mine. Uh, go back, have a look through the YouTube channel. If you're not watching on YouTube, there is a YouTube channel. Look up Shelf Analysis. You'll find it there. You'll find all of the old episodes as well on RTE Culture too. And if you're watching in the uh, Ricochet Book Club tonight, uh, evening, how are you? Hope all is well. I've got a few bits and pieces I need to let you know about. Um, let me start with, firstly, Book Show. Uh, the Book Show is back on RTE Radio 1. It's Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, our episode this week is going to be a slightly unusual one, and I like that very much. Firstly, uh, it's going to be John Connell, uh, who was here a couple of weeks ago on Shelf Analysis, talking to a book club uh, about the cow book. We allow book clubs in the country uh, to have a conversation with him about that. As well as that, Stephanie Preisner and I are talking uh, biographies. But the important bit is this. Our guests this week are going to be Carrie Franzman and Jonathan Plackett. You may not know who Carrie Franzman and Jonathan Plackett are, but they've currently just written a brand new book, which is Gender Swapped Fairy Tales. And we're going to discuss the nature of doing that, of gender swapping fairy tales, how that works and how it's worked for them with a brand new book that they have out as well. So that's a brand new episode of The Book Show. It's this coming Sunday evening on RTE Radio 1 uh, from 7 o'clock. But of course, you can get the podcast on Friday uh, late afternoon, early evening, depending on when somebody in RTE presses the magic button and puts it out there. Our podcast is available on Friday. Uh, as well as that, quick shout that this coming Monday, is the day for the Eason Must Reads for Winter. Uh, Sinead Moriarty and myself pick four times a year a series of books that usually end up in Eason stores around the country, but of course, bookshops being closed at the moment, you won't physically be able to buy them in your Eason stores, but you will be able to get them online. And um, we've picked eight cracking books that have yet to be announced. The only one thing that I'm probably not supposed to tell you, but I will, is that we've been doing this for three years now. And next year, 2021, will be our fourth year of doing must reads. We've picked a ton of Irish books in that. And I think, I think we've almost picked more Irish books than non Irish books. It's the first time, entirely coincidentally, Sinead and myself have picked eight Irish books for must reads. That's being announced pretty much first thing this Monday morning. Coming and you'll find it everywhere on your social medias and per usual. Uh, hashtag brand ambassador, blah, blah, blah. I have to say that. It's a, it's a thing. Um, Maybe I don't have to say it, but I'm saying it anyway, just in case. I want to give a very quick shout out to this as well. If you are a member of the Ricochet Book Club, uh, you'll find us on Facebook. If you are not, just look up the Ricochet Book Club. There are books of the month for November uh, are out. We've announced these. These are the two that we'd like you to consider reading uh, for the month of November. On the left is Laura Bates' Exceptional Men Who Hate Women. You may or may not know of Laura Bates. Uh, she is the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project. Uh, this book, you can see it on the title, From Incels to Pick Up Art Artists, The Truth About Extreme Misogyny and How It Affects Us All. There are books that you read maybe once every two, three years that pull back a curtain on a world that maybe you thought you knew and you thought you knew a lot about, or you thought you knew most things about, and then all of a sudden you realized you didn't. This is one of those books. It's an extraordinary read, and I urge you to read it. Catherine Ryan Howard's The Nothing Man is our second choice as well, which is a completely at the opposite end of the scale. Um, uh, Catherine, one of our previous guests here on Shelf Analysis as well, you can go back uh, and have a look at that. Two stories, one killer, no mercy. This is exactly what you need at this time of year. And with everything else going on in the world, you need to lose yourself a bit of Catherine Ryan Howard. Uh, pop into the book club. We're uh, talking about those books all throughout the course of the month. Final one, really briefly. I had a moment the other day 
it frequently happens, where um, I realized uh, it turned up as one of my memories on Facebook that I realized that we wouldn't obviously be able to have a physical Christmas party this year. If you remember the book club for the last, I think, four years now, we've had physical real world Christmas parties. Uh, the last couple of years, it's been in Easton's and O'Connell Street uh, in Dublin. Authors come in, they come and have a bit of a chat. They do some readings. In fact, Ronan Hessian, who is our guest tonight on Shelf Analysis, was the star turner at last year's Christmas party. Uh, even though he didn't realize it himself at the time, he turned out to be. Well, I'll have a chat with him about that in a minute. Um, but this year we can't have one. There won't be one, a physical one in the real world. I didn't want to let people down. And I'm conscious of just how isolated people may be feeling at this time of year. So instead, I've launched the Ricochet Book Club Christmas Festival. We'll be having a four-night festival, all events online. You'll be able to find them in the book club and hopefully, fingers crossed, here on the YouTube channel as well. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, four very different and four very separate events. I hope there's something for everybody in it. I'll tell you more about it as we get closer to it as well. But I do want to give a big shout out to these guys because I needed a sponsor. Um, in order for me to pay all of the authors who are going to come and do stuff at my festival, uh, I don't have pockets that are that big. So. I needed a sponsor. I put a call out online, and within the space of a couple of hours, the wonderful people at Black Knight Solutions, who are the people who host my two websites and have done so for many years, uh, and you can buy your domain names from them, and they host websites, and they do all that kind of stuff from their base in Carlo, uh, got onto me and said, OK, what exactly are you looking for? And what do we get for that? OK, seems fine. And it was done on a virtual handshake just like that. Thank you to Black Knight. You will hear an awful lot more about them uh, as our sponsors of the Christmas Festival. The Christmas Festival will be happening in the middle of December. I'll keep you well up to date on that. Last shout out, just because it was so much fun, it, was, it wasn't a regular episode of Shelf Analysis. We put this out over the course of the weekend on Saturday. If you missed me talking to John Banville, that was episode 50 of Shelf Analysis. It is back on the YouTube channel. If you're watching on RT Culture, you'll find it there as well. Um, it was amazing. And it was just a wonderful 40 odd minutes to spend with John Banfield. He did smile. Look, I found a picture of him smiling. He recited poetry to me. We talked about Rilke. Um, it was just a, a joy to spend um, 40 odd minutes um, with one of Ireland's best known and most famous authors. And he picked some really interesting things as well. That shelf analysis is available for you now if you fancy getting your hands on it. Briefly, Last one, I swear, before we get to the star turn tonight. Uh, shelf analysis next week. I tend not to flag these things so far in advance. I am going to with this because this one has been a long time coming and it's taken a while just to get all the pieces in all the right places. But this time next week, uh, 8 o'clock next Wednesday, live here on Shelf Analysis and answering your questions, if you fancy it, is going to be the one and only Neil Gaiman. Uh, Neil Gaiman is live on Shelf Analysis this time next week. You can ask him anything about anything, and I fully intend to, and he's going to pick a bunch of things that he thinks you might like as well. That is not a bonus episode. It's a live one, and it's this night week, Wednesday, November 11th at 8 p.m. Am I done? I'm going to shut up now. I've been talking for eight and a bit of minutes. I've had enough of this. Tonight's guest uh, on Shelf Analysis is the author of the... of. For me, one of the more extraordinary books that I came across over the space of the last 18 months in that I expected nothing from this book. And I knew nothing about this book beforehand. And it came from a publisher in the UK I had never heard of before. And all I kind of sort of knew was that the guy who'd written it was in a band that I kind of sort of heard of. And that was it. And Leonard and Hungry Paul turned out to be one of the books that I pressed into the hands of human beings more than any other in the intervening time. It has been one of those books that's become a word of mouth phenomenon. And rather than embarrass him any further, I will press this button and say, run on Hessian. Good evening and welcome to Shelf Analysis. Good evening, Rick. Thanks for having me and hello to everyone uh, watching at home. It is it is my pleasure. Listen, let you, remind us again, because you did come to the Christmas party last year and I kind of said, listen, would you mind doing a bit of a reading from Leonard and Hungry Paul. And you were kind of like a rock star afterwards. There was a queue of people who wanted to get books signed. Yeah, it was it was really strange because, you know, I hadn't done that many book events or, or even readings. Uh, I wasn't that long involved in writing. And you, you very kindly invited me up. And so, you know, I just stood up at the, at the front of the room. It was sort of like a, you know, primary school seats plastic seats with everyone sitting in rows. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just read the first chapter. And it's funny, uh, with readings, I find before them, you're sort of thinking, how does this work? You know, because I'm used to music where there's, there's a degree of performance, whereas with books, it's not quite the same. And uh, so I just, I just read it and just enjoyed it. And uh, people laughed in the right places and, and, and that kind of thing. And it was a really lovely reaction. And it was nice because there was time afterwards to to talk to people and to just, just hang out and 
it was very uh, you know democratic and accessible you just hung out it was all very I really enjoyed it you caused consternation in, in Eason's that night because John the manager came up to me afterwards and he said I have a problem I didn't buy in enough copies of the book and we've just sold out so you probably could have sold an awful lot more copies of the, of the book that night if, if they, they, they thought about it in advance even John if you're watching um so now that I've I, I've mentioned it and you know the thought has occurred to me I pulled out all those graphics and I do it every week and I haven't actually got wait hang on wait for it normally I have a graphic of this instead I'm going to do this so from my own shelf here this is Leonard and Hungry Paul the extraordinarily covered uh, book tell us a little bit about Leonard and Hungry Paul and about where it came from and about about its genesis yeah well I, I wasn't really a writer you know before I started uh, writing this book I hadn't a background in writing uh, you know although I've been involved in songwriting for a very long time and if I think back, there are signs in my past that, that I'd be interested in writing. But I had just, uh, it was the start of, I think, 2017. And I had a new diary. And I said, I had, I had been getting these sort of flashes and these images and settings and scenes for the, for the character who eventually became Leonard. Uh, and I decided I would write a little bit about him. And I figured the best way to understand the character was just to try and you know, maybe just write little short vignettes or little even just glimpses of what he's like or in my talk. And after really the first day of that, I said, well, well forget that. I just I just try writing a novel. I just I just I read I always read a lot. And, you know, I'm a fan of novels and there was nothing stopping me. It's a great thing about writing compared to, say, music where you have to, you know, rent a studio. You have to talk to musicians. You can just do it pretty much uh, whenever you want. Uh, and I quite quickly got to about 10,000 words. Uh, and I'd sort of been told by the internet that 10,000 <laughs> words was, if you got that far, you, you probably had enough momentum to keep going. And I hadn't really planned uh, the story. I had a general idea of where it was going to go. But really, I just wrote it a chapter at a time every night after my kids went to bed. Uh, I'd just sit down at the laptop and just bash it out. Uh, and the, the book itself is really a book about, about gentle people. It's about quiet people, the kind of people who are, are extraordinary in their own way, but are so easily overlooked in life. Uh, and it's really just an, an exploration of their world. And I tried and as best I could to provide a, a, a sort of scenario where we will get to shift our expectations of them over the course of the book and try to understand how they react to change. And, and I suppose, they have one thing that both Leonard and Hungry Paul have is that they pay attention to what doesn't change in life. You know, you can easily be thrown by all the churn and we like to focus on change and, you know, what's new and what's unsettling in life. But there's a whole stratum of life that's quite stable and which is easily ignored. And they sort of live in that sort of wavelength. I think it's the conversation that 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 myself and and my wife have had so many times about how when you think things are going perfectly well for you in life and everything's kind of hunky dory and you know that everything's fine that something is going to go terribly wrong and there's going to be drama, but of course that's what drama has taught us. That's not what real life necessarily teaches us. And Leonard and Hungry Paul are that story about two people for whom they live kind of nice, semi ordinary human wonderful you know rich but not full of drama lives did you think that you would manage to make a full novel out of it? i mean when you brought it to the publishers did they say yeah but but you know where's the car crashes and where's the where's the, where's the drama where, where's the murder yeah i was i was just talking to my wife about this because I, I discovered quite recently that my wife's a few generations back her great great grandfather used to own an umbrella shop uh, and I was thinking about that probably explains why she and a lot of people I know, you know, are, are like an umbrella shop owner. They're, they're kind of planning for the worst. Even, mm -hmm. even when it's a good day, they like to leave the house with an umbrella or they'll buy one just in case. Um, I, I didn't want to write an, a novel uh, with drama. And in fact, I, when I go on to talk about the books, I, I, read, I read books from all around the world. Um, and what you find the more widely you read is that that idea, that conflict or drama is central to a narrative. It, it, as far as I can see, and I'm, I'm not an expert, but as far as I can see, is very much an Anglophone uh, approach. 
mm. very much the English speaking world likes to construct narrative around an incident, drama, conflict. And it, it kind of becomes a default. But yet when you read uh, work from other cultures, you see that there are many, many different approaches. Uh, and when I approached, uh, I really didn't think the book would be published. And I don't mean that in any self-deprecating sense, because I did believe in it as a book. But I just, I figured, I knew a little bit about the music scene. I figured the book scene was probably kind of similar where you had to pitch your book and you had to have a, you know, a hook and you had to say, well, where does it fit in? And I said, this book just doesn't pass those tests. Mm -hmm. um, but that was fine. I, I didn't really want to be a writer for the sake of being a writer. I wanted to write this book. Uh, and I came across a book called Man with a Seagull on His Head by Harriet Page, an English writer, which, which was a similarly mellow sort of book and, and quite a thoughtful book. And I was very impressed by it. Uh, and that introduced me to the publisher of Blue Moose, who are based in Hebden Bridge, uh, which is in Yorkshire. And well, I sort of had in the back of my mind that if I could get anyone to publish it, I'd like it to be Blue Moose. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be picky ultimately if, you know, the only person who would publish it would, would be, you know, as I was a rat poison company, I would have gone with the rat poison company. Where, where, but I sent it to Blue Moose and, uh, on a Friday night. and. Kevin Duffy, who runs Blue Moose, uh, who walks his dogs early in the morning, emailed me back at seven o'clock and said, okay, I've read the first three chapters. Can you send me the rest of it? So I did that and within a week uh, he was back and he, 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 was, uh, he, he actually tweeted out something about the book and a quote from it and saying he can't wait to tell the world about it. So I thought, that sounds promising. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he sent me an email, which I was, I was in books upstairs, if anyone knows that, that bookshop, which is now on Delir Street. I was in there on my lunch break and let out a silent, and a <laughs> scream of excitement because uh, he gave me a mini review. And I've been into that shop and I, you know, I've said to people, you know, I, I, this was the place where it all happened. Um, and they've been very, very supportive. Like they've never, you know, Plumas have never said to me, write another letter, no be Paul, or the, during her, her approach in editing is really, uh, I'm, not saying, I'm not sure if it's unique, but it's very, very special. You work with one editor very closely over a long period of time. And it's really about coaxing the book out. There's no sort of sense of conformity or, or trying to uh, undermine what the book's about or trying to make it into a more conventionally marketable book. I also think that perhaps Leonard and Hungry Paul came along at a time when people needed Leonard and Hungry Paul. They needed a book like that to disappear into, to use it as a sanctuary from the rest of the world. I certainly know when I read it, I, f I found it that way. And I've seen a lot of people talking about it in the book club and elsewhere as being, you know, a wonderful antidote to 2019, 2020, and probably beyond. Who knows where we're going to be by the time we get to tomorrow? Yeah, certainly people have, it's interesting because the book came out uh, obviously long before COVID or anything like that. So, and it, it seems to just riding, I won't say waves, but gentle ripples, uh, you know, where, where people are looking for, I suppose, a book that is that bit quieter, a book that uh, has warm. And I think fundamentally with the book, what the book has, or certainly I hope it has, is sincerity. Uh, I think sometimes in writing there is a tendency or a temptation to be uh to, to write a phrase on a critiquing perspective mm -hmm. uh to observe the world and and make comments about it perhaps withering comments about the world i did want to gamble and write a book that stood for something that gave a version of the world uh, and it's funny it's only when i've got a bit of perspective on it. i remember thinking back and my son who's now almost 12 had said to me at one stage uh, in the back of the car a couple of years ago um you know when i grow up i might just uh you know live with nicholas and we might just play around toys are you okay with that i said yeah of course that's fine yeah and a part of me i think uh, and i'm only still remembering this you know in the last couple of months i think part of me wrote leonard and hungry paul to imagine that world mm. you know is there a world where somebody um just wants to live their life with their friends uh, and but, but have a rich understanding. You know, they're, they're not simpletons. They are not um, backward or they're not uh, in any way deficient. 
and that's something that they reveal in their own way in the course of the book yeah uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I, I again will say just one more time because I've been saying this for a very long time. If people feel in any way um, with the idea of 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 the book and and the way either you or I've spoken about it tonight, it's 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 something that you need to grab yourself a, a copy of right now. Obviously, physically not from a bookstore because they're not open right now, but nonetheless, there are other ways and means around that. Paul Murphy says Ronan's reading at last year's Christmas party was what tipped me over into buying the book. You and lots of other people, Paul. Chandrika says it, it was one of my early lockdown reads. It's like a giant hug in the form of a book. It was so gorgeous. Jackie O'Neill says it was great meeting Ronan at the Christmas party. He gave me a pair of socks. There is apparently a whole story in her comments to do with the pair of socks. I don't want to know. Um, Francis says, Leonard and Hungry Paul, one of my favorite books last year. Highly recommended. Hello to Cat Hogan, who's here tonight. He's one of the kindest and most supportive writers as well. You look, you look, but before we get any further in this, let's maybe do what we're supposed to be here for, because you are here to talk about uh, books that you like and love. And you've been teasing some of this on social during the week, which I, I quite like the idea of. So tell me what you plumped for and tell me where you would like to start. Yeah, so I, I, I do love reading, you know, and I think um, my writing is an extension of, of my reading. And I, I I wanted to try and blitz you with about a thousand books in a sort of generation game conveyor belt where I would quickly uh, whistle through each description. But I decided to be a bit more moderate. I think having watched John Banville, I said, OK, I'll try and be a little bit classy. Uh, you know, you don't <laughs> he did take to... his time. He took his time on a few of them, very much so, yeah. Yeah, and he was quite thoughtful in what he said about them. So I said, I, I'll, I'll try. I won't be John Banville-esque, but you know, I will. I will try and have a go. I mean, you know, try and do it calmly. So the first book, I, and this is a book. Um, so this is a book by uh, John. I call him John Foss, but I think it's pronounced Jan Fosse. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Norwegian writer, and it's translated by Damien Searles. If anyone knows these books, they look like school books, but they're published by. Uh, a really good publisher in the UK called Fitzcarraldo, and all their books look like that. And it's really run by two people. They have two Nobel Prize winners in, on their books, uh, and only gone a few years. But Jan Fosse is a Norwegian writer, and this this book is it's an example of what he calls slow prose. So it's a single sentence, and um, it's a, 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 a an older man who's a painter, close to retirement. He's also a widower. He lives in southwest uh, Norway in a very isolated area. And his only real social contact is really with his neighbor, who's a kind of ordinary farmer, or dropping into town to drop his paintings in. But within that, he sort of weaves a whole life, a whole imagination. Now, I know when you say a slow Norwegian novel, all one sentence, people are like, you're all right. Um, but it really is, there's humor in it, and it's very, very profound, but it's it's very, just very smooth to read. Uh, and I, I had changed my writing type, and my writing or my reading approach a little bit, and this was the first book I experimented with. I normally would read a book and then another book and another book. And I, I felt I was enjoying books so much I was flying through them, but they were coming and going in my life too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I decided to do was have a daytime book and then a nighttime book. So I read this and I, I limited myself to maybe like 20 or 30 pages at bedtime over, say, two weeks uh, and really just took it in. And it's just a very, very beautiful book. And the, the second installment, this is called Septology. So it's, it's in seven parts. So the first two parts are in this. And parts uh, three, four, and five have just come out. And the final concluding bit is uh, to be published next year. But he's a very, um, a very beautiful writer. It, it all it feels there's a real almost spiritual sense from the book. It almost feels, and if I was ever told, okay, roll on, you're down, this, you're down to your last few weeks, looks bad news, and you've got you know, terminal baldness or whatever it is, and you you've only got your last couple of books, that you just want to have a nice soft landing. I think these would be the books I'd pick because okay. they're very inspiring. They're a little bit melancholy. But they're they're quite uh, they're quite unpretentious actually. Uh, he's he's a very you know he's a very inspiring writer. I think he's very he's very well known internationally. That was the first thing I'd read about his. But I think he's the most translated um, uh, playwright in Europe. Uh, sometimes he's spoken of in, in Nobel terms, but he, he's not he's not a, I don't think anyway a, a difficult writer to read as so long as you have the patience for no paragraph breaks. 
I, I, I think firstly, I mean, terminal boldness is something that's not talked about often enough, frankly, and it's something that we maybe we can have a conversation about later. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, it, strangely, I've started doing the the day book, night book thing uh, a, a while back as well. And one of the ones I read as my night book was Drive Your Plough Over the Bones of the Dead, which is another one of the Fitzcarraldo books. And I know what you're saying. Sometimes they, they look, they're incredibly simple. The cover design is almost identical on, on, on all of them. I think that almost makes them like fetish items for me, though. I really like that as a piece of as a piece of, 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 of design work. Okay, it's a great starting point. Where are we going next? Next is a book that that um, is probably up there with Beyond Foss as, as my sort of book of the year, and it's uh, Breasts and Eggs by Miko Kawakami, and it's translated by Sam Bett and, and David Boyd, two translators working on this. So this is a very interesting book. It was originally it's in two parts. It's a, it's a thick enough book. It's a bit, on the page, I think. The first part was published as a, as a novella uh, a few years ago, and it won the uh, Kutagawa Prize, which is one of the main literary prizes in Japan. And that, that prize tends to reward novellas. A lot of Japanese books that make it into translation are quite small because they come from that prize. Uh, and it starts off, it really tells the perspective of a 30-something woman uh, living in Osaka. Uh, Miko Kawakami is from Osaka. Uh, I'm told by people who live in Japan and people who know that Osaka to Tokyo is kind of like Manchester to London. So, and they have a particular dialect of Osaka Ben. Um, and there's a big discussion online about the translation of this book because an alternative translation of the first section was out previously. Mm -hmm. And it's quite spicy in using vernacular and curse words and so on, which whereas this one is quite staid and, and quite clean. It's a, it's a beautiful read, but it's a different, it doesn't quite, neutralizes some of the more earthy elements maybe of the Osaka Ben dialect. But the story basically uh, is that you have this woman who's turning 30 uh, and her sister comes to stay with her. Her sister wants to have uh, breast augmentation surgery. She works as a hostess in a bar and she brings with her her, her teenage daughter who won't speak to anybody. So it begins with a whole discussion around the, those sort of themes. It's very light and very conversational. Uh, and they're very open about their lives. And in Japan, Japan doesn't have a good reputation in terms of gender equality. Like when it comes to gender pay gap, it, it scores quite badly and, and there's a lot of problems in that area. The book then for the second part jumps forward about 10 years when the narrator has published the book, is sort of starting to make a career and starting to think about uh, having a child. And in Japan, you can't um, have IVF or adopt if you're, if you're single, you have to be married. So it's very digressive. I think in some of the reviews I've read, people are not as keen on the second part because it, it, it allows space for multiple perspectives on this issue. And it's a potentially a, a, a car crash of an issue because of its sensitivity. But she hands it extremely honestly, extremely well. And I, I love the way she writes. Um, I've read um, uh, another one of her books, uh, Miss I Sandwich, as well. Um, so that's I, I've been saying that that's my, my book of the year. Jan Foss is up there, and I've just read another book, which I'm writing a review, so I won't say what it is, but for the notebook, which, which I think will be maybe my top three of the year, but Press and Eggs, it really, certainly as a man, I think, I don't think I've ever read a book that was as much of a sort of tutorial, you know, and I'm, I'm married 15 years, you know, my wife 21 years, so I, I thought I, I had got past level one in terms of understanding, uh, you know, women's lives and so on, but uh, it was really illuminating, but not in any way in a hectoring or tutorial way. It was a very it was drawn out in the story. So I'm very impressed with that. I, I, I think that you and I both share a mutual love of, of contemporary Japanese fiction as well. And I think we, we've talked about this kind of online back and back and forth before. That is downstairs in the TBR. Shamefully, I haven't gotten to it yet. I have gotten to other stuff this year. I read uh, Sayaka Murata's Earthlings, which I saw a review of, I think, in The Guardian today, which is mental in the best possible way of contemporary Japanese fiction. Um, it's definitely not a, a convenience store woman, which was her, her previous one but before this. It's definitely one that, you know, if, if you're willing to, to, to deal with the subjects that it deals with, it can be quite hard and it's a very strange universe that she, she creates out of that. That is absolutely in, in, my, in my list of uh, ones to, to, to get to as well. There is something about contemporary Japanese fiction. I don't know whether it's not, you know, speaking as a man who has a, where is it? I have an entire Ruki Murakami shelf behind me here. Um, but in terms of, uh, I don't know whether he's opened a door to so many other contemporary Japanese authors, because it seems just even to me as somebody who's been reading this, that over the last maybe four, five, six years, that there's been a lot of stuff that has been put out there in translation, presumably because there's, there's a market for it. 
Yeah, I think I think I think so. I, I might just cheat a bit. I'm going to just jam a, 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 a kind of do in case the case of glass and um, read for Japanese books. Just on that subject, there, there are some. I think Japanese writers, I think, are the best in the world uh, at the moment, and probably have been for uh, much of the 20th century too. There was a huge delay in translations, so even with a uh, something like Earthlings, uh, I'm not sure where it comes in, in the writer's actual sequence of books, but say in the International Booker, uh, Stephen Schneider's uh, translation of the memory piece by Yoko Ogawa was, was long, it was shortlisted and was actually quite hotly tipped to win. But that was first published in 1994. Mm. So I think it was a very, very long time. And I actually, and my New Year's resolution this year was to, to learn Japanese and I've stuck at it. I'm on 306 day streak and, you know, still rocking on. And uh, oh. really, uh, it's actually quicker to learn Japanese than to wait for the books to be translated, which is a real shame. And there's also a problem with books that were previously translated falling out of print. So I'm just going to do a quick whistle through. Yeah, the please do. Books. Absolutely. I'd love that. One of my favorite Japanese writers is uh, Banana Yoshimoto. Um, she, this is NP, which stands for North Point. And the translator on this one is Anne Sharif, who I don't know. Uh, Megan Macris does a lot of her books. Uh, Banana Yashimoto is just a beautiful, beautiful writer. It's almost kind of YA sort of at times, but her first novel, Kitchen, which you know when, when she was about 21 or two, is a real classic. This is a this is a lovely book. The, the, the real theme of her books, I think, is when a young person experiences grief and it never leaves them. I, I lost my father when I was seven, uh, and I can really relate to that. There's something, if you experience profound grief when you're young, it has a weird paradoxical effect. It, it makes you old before your time, and it also freezes you in child mode forever. It's kind of this weird mix. Uh, and I think that comes through my own writing, actually. I think it's a mix of, uh, you know, it's one of the feeling, uh, uh, you know, older than I am, and then other times of the kiddish side. It, it keeps those two things in parallel. She's a very sensitive writer beautiful writer so banana yashimoto is great i ha i again have and bought with my own cold hard cash and um, kitchen is sitting downstairs in my extensive giant tbr so i'm 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 gonna push that and the miyako kebokami up as well okay what else have you got yeah there's a really good short story to back a kitchen as well called moonlight shadow it's really good and um, okay. this one you know, don't bother this is the worst cover you'll ever see okay it's <laughs> like a, a 1954 department of agriculture uh, annual report <laughs> Um, and it's by a writer called uh, Sawako Ariyoshi, and the, the publisher or the, the translator is Mildred Tahara. This book was first published in 1973 and sold over a million copies in Japan. And it's an example of where Japanese writers were way out of their time. It talks about dementia, uh, and the, the, the character is left looking after her father in law. So the, 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 the man's own family don't take any responsibility for his care, it's left to the daughter in law because that's traditionally it. And it talks very realistically about the, front day, the frustrations of being a carer. Uh, and it's a book that's this age 50 years old. But it's one of those books that was very important in its time. But sort of 20th century translations are kind of forgotten. They're done by small academic pu publishers. They don't have any buzz around them. So I think there's a real need to preserve them. And I have a real cracker, actually. And before we, before we do that, you're yeah. right. You did skim over the cover. What's the title of that book? Sorry, The Twilight Years. The Twilight Years. Lovely. People will Twilight ask. Years. Good. There you go. Already somebody's asking, what's the name of that Sawako Ryoshi book? Great. Apologies, Twilight yeah. Years. Good. This next one is, is called Translucent Tree. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful book. It's written by Nobuko Tagaki, and it's translated by Deborah uh, Iwabuchi. It's a nice cover as well. So you see the Translucent yeah. Tree there. Yeah. And then uh, this comes apart. Oh, that's uh, super. And that deals in metaphor. This this is a really interesting book because it deals with um, a relationship between two people in their 40s, two people who kind of don't want to get together and they're just unhappy in their own lives and they end up together. Uh, and it gets a little spicy at times, but uh, it, it's a very, I think, original take on a love story. Uh, and it's the only book available by that writer in, in translation. And I was extremely impressed by it. I've thought about it a lot. Uh, it, it's handling of relationship dynamics. I think so, so often when relationships are written about, there's a lot of writing about getting over the initial lack of communication, a bit of misunderstanding, getting to know each other. This skips that. And they just get into it. And they just have a, a very sort of um, a compromised version of love 
but it's a version that they can make work. And it's very sad and it's very, very beautiful. The last Japanese one I'll just say quickly, actually it's not the last one, the last one I'll give, is called The Master of Go uh, by Yazanari Kawabata, who, who is, uh, he, was a, he won the Nobel Prize, first Japanese. Only two Japanese writers have won the Nobel Prize, him and Kenzaburo Oe. They really should have a lot more. Um, this is translated by Edward G. Stephen Sticker, who's kind of, a, he's a Harvard academic, very famous. This is really interesting because it's about the game of Go. I've never played it, but it's a board game, a sort of chess-like board game with pieces. And it's about uh, a master of that game in his final days when he is facing an up-and-coming player. And it's one of those examples where the game is very complex. It's really, really... Yasunari Kawabata wrote articles for the newspaper about real Go tournaments. And it's built around that. But it, it's fantastic. You, you don't need to follow the game or understanding. It's, its ability, its character drawing, its ability to make you love a subject you know nothing about is just amazing. Um, so I, I think maybe for those people who don't get Go, you're right. If anybody watched the TV series of Brave New World recently, the overall world controller played Go. It was one of those things. And I remember I read a book quite recently as well talking about artificial intelligence where they suggested that it, it was never when a computer would beat a human at chess that computers would be seen to have reached a certain point. It was when it could beat a Go master playing Go, which computers have, have done. That was seen to be a much, much higher bar than, than just playing chess against, against a human. And if, you know, you were talking earlier about drama and so on. That's a really interesting example. If, if you, if you, if, I, if you were to blindfold somebody and say, "Tell me how a novel about two people in a sport or game is going to go," they, they will do something like the karate kid, say, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and they will expect it. This doesn't go that path at all, uh, and it's actually a much richer book for. And Japanese novels tend. To me, I think their structure is almost like poetry. You know, when you read a poem and it just takes you to a new place and leaves you there, it, it doesn't give you answers. It doesn't uh, try and mess with your adrenaline. Uh, and I, I love the way, it's a great skill to that. Uh, and there's a great sense of, um, I think, trusting the reader in, in that. Okay. Um, so I have one more Japanese thing, but I'll come back to in a sec. The other thing, um, obviously, you know, tonight's a very big night. Uh, you know, Watford are playing Stoke. And uh, when I came on this call, it was at one all, so obviously very tight. And I can understand a lot of people find that stressful. So I decided to, I put, uh, this is a book of poems called City Works Department by Philip Hancock. And Philip Hancock is from Stoke. He's a painter and decorator. Uh, and he's worked at that all his life. Uh, and this was published by a really good publisher called CB Editions based in London. And Philip, I, when I bought this book, I heard Philip do a reading at, at a sort of Zoom literary event, and uh, I, I loved it. And I bought this book straight away, and I carried it around in the same way that a child will carry around their favourite blankie. Uh, I, my wife was sick of me just arriving into the kitchen and saying, can I just re read you a poem? It's not a romantic poem, but can I read you a poem? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was going to read something from it, if that's okay. Do you know, weirdly, Sevna Mielmaz just said, I'm not sure if this is a thing, but I'd love to hear Ronan reading from his voice again, if that was possible. I've actually had somebody just request that you read something. By the way, as well, uh, Watford are currently 2-1 up against Stoke, just so you know. In the oh, great, oh, great. Yeah, dude. that's great. Well done. We, we need first that. Time, actually, we've first time, it's the first time we've had sporting updates in the middle of an episode of Shelf Analysis. I'm all for this. Please re read us. Well, well, what are you going to read from? I'm going to read a poem of his called The Girl from the Triangle House. And there's a football relevance here. It's dedicated to Kerry Davis. Uh, now, I didn't know who Kerry Davis is, but Kerry Davis is from Stoke. Uh, and she was on the England women's football team. And she's actually that. I think the fourth highest scoring English international footballer of all time. She scored 42 goals for England. She's only behind uh, Wayne Rooney, Carrie Lineker and Ginny Greaves. But she, if you see a picture of her, she's got this crazy red curly hair and freckles all over. And Philip Hancock, uh, I think this is autobiographical, autobiographical knew her uh, and grew up near her. And this is, this is practically a love poem about her playing football and running rings around everyone on the street. Love it. So it's called The Girl from the Triangle House. A gunshot in a one-horse town is the crack of the latch on her garden gate. Starlings flit to the pylons. Boundary hawthorns stir. Our trailing feet break the roundabout. Lithe and angular with a paprika afro. 
She jigs behind a World Cup football. 40 keep-ups, then shooting in. Riggers draw the short straw. Paddles in the crater beneath the crossbar, always fooled by her touch. The ball gummed to the crisscross lacing of her left boot and wrong-footed by her step over, undone by her nutmeg. Simple passing, long after the evening sentinels have been posted and the three blind mice run off with Giannisi's Isis until paraffin heat sweats greenhouse panes and empty buses flicker between the houses like cinefilm. Tonight, the stone I dribble along the pavement won't escape me. I turn for home, head full of those orange freckles coming out like stars, of boots like hers, pumas with the white flash. Oh, I think that's just joyous. I, one, of the, one of the most amazing things for me throughout all of the 51 episodes of this is the number of people who've talked about poetry, which is something that I might not necessarily have expected at, at, at the beginning of the series. And those people who've decided to read it as well. That's beautiful. Remind us the title of that collection again. So that's Philip Hancock, City Works Department. And this is, I, I've, um, I've bought this for quite a few people, actually. You know, I've, this is the book, you know, when people sort of on Twitter say, you know, I've had enough, uh, you know, and, and you just sort of drop them a DM and say, I think there's a book you might, you might, because yeah. it's, it, and it's beautiful because it's about his life as a painter and decorator, but it, it and it doesn't, uh, it has, you know, it's so easy to make that sort of, uh, you know, we're working class and it's all, to overdo that. But it's actually, you know, he, there's, there's another poem where he talks about how he's, you know, he, he's painting the windows uh, and a woman comes in and starts getting changed and she runs off embarrassed. And, and he's sort of saying, little does she know, all I want is the ability to reach the corner without having to stretch from the ladder <laughs> and to make sure that the latch opens smoothly. You know, that's, you know, so he has those kind of Lovely. beautiful observations uh, and he's, he's such a, it's, some people just have that, it's almost like a footballer's touch. You know, they can just get the perfect weight in the pass. Mm. Some poets are like that. It's just the perfect weight in the line. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know much about poetry, and it's, 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 this, this lockdown has really got me into a few new poets, and it's, it's really been a joy in my life. It's been super. Where, where else are we going to go then? Where, where, where next? We've been to Japan, we have been uh, through Fitzcarraldo's back catalogue, you got some poetry, what's next? So the next one um, I'm going to talk about is Catherine the Great and the Small uh, by uh, Olya Knezevich, who's from Montenegro. And there are two translators on this, Paula Gordon and Ellen Elias Bursach. Uh, this is a really, really good book. It's by a publisher called Istros Books. They publish, they only publish books in the Balkans. And the sort of best kept secret in international literature is writing from the Balkans, Croatia, um, from Slovenia. And this is the first time I read something from Montenegro. If, if you're a writer or you're interested in the subject of structure, they are completely, when I spoke about the Anglophone approach of drama, conflict, they don't do that at all. They're brilliant at weaving uh, life stories, brilliant at blending it with the backdrop, and obviously the interesting backdrop of the dissolution of Yugoslavia, which in itself was a patchwork of identities. So writing about identity in a way where sometimes identity, it can be used as a sort of garment, you know, where it's something you can either decide to have or not have. You know, a point of view or a particular affiliation to a, a cause or so on. But I think writers from the Balkans are extremely good about writing an identity as, as not the stuff you choose, but the stuff you can't get rid of uh, and that you have to become reconciled to. So it's a very honest portrait of a woman going through her life, including becoming a parent and being quite a mixed parent and having mixed feelings about being a parent. Uh, and all the relationships she has with family with, within her love life. And it's just written in this incredibly close way. You know, you write, you read it. And I always feel when I read writers uh, like this and, you know, writers like Dasha Dermdich and Alia Savicevic, you, you finish reading them and you really feel you've been in another life. There isn't this sort of sense of, this is a story I'm reading with my eyes. You really do, they do bring you through it. Uh, and, you know, I think this is a really good example of that. I think if, it's, if you're looking to take a chance on a book uh, from that region, I think this is a really good one to start with. Um, 
I, 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 I was thinking just just before we you go on, I, I frequently find that as well with cinema from those countries, in that obviously it's something to do with the nature of storytelling in non-Anglophone countries, but that you'll sometimes find those same joys in watching movies from, from France or from Japan or from the, the, the former Balkan states or from Scandinavia. The, they tell stories in a, in a kind of entirely unique fashion. It's, it's, it's off topic, but I think it's, it's, the, the, you can find the same joys in that as well. Sorry, where are you? Well, well what's next? Okay, um, well, you know, as I say in middle management, I'm very aware of the time. <laughs> so um, the next one we're going to, to Ireland, merry old Ireland, and, and a bit of America. Alice Lyons is a really good writer. This is her first uh, novel, but she's written poetry. She's also a painter. And a bit like Young Fossey, and there's a few examples, and you know, Sarah Baum is another one, uh, uh, another artist who is competence in different forms and there's they're, they're very free about letting their painting perspective uh you know contaminate their writing and, and likewise so it's very good it's a really good book it's a really beautiful cover as well um but alice writes really really well it's it's a very interesting story about i suppose she's always kind of an outsider you know she has a bit of an american perspective in ireland you know living down in rural ireland during the celtic tiger she brings that but it's just a very thoughtful book. There's no use of the, the, the letter O in the book, okay? So I know some people get put off by that and some people love that. So, uh, but I would say I didn't even notice. Um, it's just beautifully written. And I love, I think what I, what I love is, is when somebody has a very uh, f fresh perspective. You know, some people have a gift for spontaneity. So they will look at a situation and they'll seem to always see it new, you know, and it just comes across in the writing. And I love the way she writes about things that are actually quite familiar to me. And they feel very new. So I, that's that's a book that I read. Again, that was another one of my bedtime books. So I started getting into bedtime books. This is one uh, that I said, oh, yeah, this, you, you want to read this quietly at the end of the day. This isn't a book you want to be, you know, having headphones uh, on the dart or, you know, that you want to try and do it when you should be raising your children, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and probably the last one, I'll, I'll finish with this now, okay? Because I've never read... Uh, a graphic novel before. Again, this is Japanese again. This is called The Man Without Talent by Yoshiharu Tsuke. Immediately, uh, I know that if I found that in a bookstore, I would immediately pick that up and I'd be fascinated by it. Okay, tell me about that. So it's translated by Ryan Holmberg. And that's, I, I, I bought it for the cover. Yeah. Um, I saw it on, on, online uh, and I basically spent the last six months spending my lunch money on books. You know? <laughs> so I'm kind of working from home or, or bringing in sandwiches and I, I just mentally buy a sandwich from Kenny's books or from go to a bookshop or books upstairs and that's why I've been quieted in building the road on Hessian library which I will leave to a good cause uh, when that, that time comes um, and but it, it's wonderful, just I, I never get you so, yeah yeah so because, you know, it does get it does get everybody everyone uh, it's it's quite tragic. Everyone who goes bald uh, eventually dies. It's it's very very sad, really. It, um, it's rough. Yeah, I've, I've heard. Yeah, it could take a hundred years, but it does. Um, but the the the, the, big, the, the, the I'd never read this way, and I, I suppose it became a bit like reading poetry, a bit like um, you, you know, trying to read a bit of nonfiction. I, I felt I was getting too into the novel world, and as a novelist, I just finished writing a novel, and I was reading those novels, and I was thinking, if you're not careful, you're going to become a technical writer somebody who can just see the things that you need to learn about storytelling and how different ways it's done. And, and I just loved the way, if I just give you an example of the sort of um, look of it, uh, it's quite a sad, he, he's, he's a man and the only thing he can do is draw cartoons uh, and his, he sort of fails his family basically. Uh, and it's completely unromantic and there's lots of nice and uh, very interesting uh, depictions of minor characters. And I liked, I just liked the feeling of reading it. I liked the, it was kind of restful on my eyes to be able to read 30 pages or 40 pages or something without going mm, left to right the whole time. You could just look at the images and take them in. And it slowed me down a bit. So I, I've, I've been trying to retrain myself as a reader. You can easily, when, you, when you're enthusiastic about books, become a voracious consumer of them, you know, and you want them. I, 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 I offer mini therapy sessions on Twitter to people who, who get stuck in that. I always say, you know, your, your, to, your to be read list is treated like a, a wine rack or, or like a wine cellar. Like it's not something, you don't have to drink all the bottles of wine, you know, to get finished. They're there for when you need them. 
Books and you, you, you are allowed, you're allowed to lay down bottles for future years as well. That's a perfectly yeah. acceptable thing to do. You can do that with books. That's part of the fun of it. Good. Glad to see we're on that page. Good night. So that's, uh, so I, 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 have a, I have a zillion other books, but I'll probably leave it there in terms of. That's an Oh, can I, just say, can I just say one other book, actually? One other book. Yes, right? of course. And, and, and it's a publisher, because I think we're, we're coming up to uh, Christmas and people want to buy special books and so on. This is a publisher I just discovered this year. I didn't scroll, they were always around. See that? Lovely metallic. That's Claire Allen called The Blackbird. And it's published by Henningham Family Press, David and Ping Henningham in London. So you, you, what happened was you broke up there at the exact moment where you said the name of the press. Scroll back slightly and give us that. Okay, so it's Henningham Family Press. Family, gotcha. David and Ping Henningham. And they only publish a small number of books every year. David is a master book binder, book designer, uh, and they are all spectacular. This one uh, is about, um, I think it's about, the, I haven't read this yet. It's about the cathedral in Liverpool. But just to show you their, their attention to detail, the paper in the cover is, is made from ingredients, including concrete. So there's a beautiful tactile feel to them. So they use, and they have another one of their books uh, uh, called uh, Mr. Beethoven, which has just been nominated for the Goldsmiths Prize. But that's made from paper imported from Japan that actually feels like uh, fabric. And you see, there's love, this beautiful, the paper's beautiful quality. They use color in terms of the chapter numbers. So as a tactile object, if if you want something really beautiful, they're, they're fantastic books as well. They've, they've been nominated for numerous awards, but something that's just a little bit special. Henning and Family Press, I would really recommend. Uh, and that's again, you can see the attention just in terms of the the reflection of it and just the feel of it. Like a book that has paper that, that has concrete in it is just so different. So that, that's just one for people unconscious. Sometimes people, especially if you're buying from other people, you want something that's a little bit. Just a little bit different and special. A little special, a little beautiful. I completely yeah. with you on that. I bring you the bad news that it's currently 2 2 between uh, Watford and Stoke in the 89th minute. That's just... that always happens. Watford, Watford <laughs> are, are teachers of philosophy. Uh, but the good news is that, again, I'm gonna, I forgot to put the graphic up, but luckily I have my own copy handy, Leonard and Hungry Paul by uh, Ron Hessian, is one of the more extraordinary books that I've read in the last couple of years, and I do heartily recommend it to everyone. Before you go, what about the next one? Because I've seen the cover. To the next one and the cover is breathtaking you've got a big standard to live up to just when it comes to the cover yeah the next book is called panenka and uh i, I it's come out really well it's re i'm really really happy with it and um, i can't wait for people to read it uh I, I love it very much it's a very different type of book and in fact the two covers probably tell you the contrast in the books you know it's uh difficult to describe um it's out in it's out in may uh, so I have a few months to think of a better description of it, but the essentially it's about uh, a man called Joseph who's in his fifties, or he is fifty actually, uh, and he he is he's lived his adult life has been very difficult for him, and he he is estranged from his daughter who he's just been uh, reintroduced to, uh, and he's facing some very uh, challenging things in his future, and it's about. Ultimately, it's about how unhappy people and broken people find happiness, uh, though not necessarily uh, a happy ending or anything like that. That's not a plot spoiler. It, it really explores brokenness uh, and how people uh, reconstruct themselves and find themselves again. It sounds uh, exceptional, and it's one of the books I'm looking forward to most in 2021. Um, can I say that was just an exceptional list of books? And and I, I've I've you know as as happens every time I finish one of these, I do end up making loads of notes, and my TBR gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But um, Ronan Hessian, it has been a genuine joy as usual, sir, to talk to you. Thanks a million for coming on Shelf Analysis. Cheers, Ronan. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks everyone for for watching at home. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ronan. Good luck. Um, yeah, we will find the list of all of Ronan's books. They'll be in comments uh, below here if you're in the Ricochet Book Club as well. You can just scroll back and have a look at You could watch the whole thing again, frankly. Can I say that that now means that this guy next week, that he's, there was a very high standard to live up to, to be honest with you. This night, next week, Wednesday, November 11th at 8pm, live here on Shelf Analysis. You can ask him whatever you fancy. Neil Gaiman is my guest next week uh, here 
on shelf analysis. Other than that, that's pretty much it for me. Am I done? That's it. There's nothing else I needed to tell you. Nothing else important. I will catch you on the book show on RTE Radio 1 this coming Sunday evening at 7 o'clock uh, or on RTE Gold weekday mornings from 10 as usual. I'm back here on shelf analysis this night, next week with Neil Gaiman. Thanks a million for watching as usual. Good luck.